Nothing ever comes easy, and that is especially true when making movies. From the initial conception to the beginning of the shoot, no one really knows whether or not their hard work will pay off. Even those that are finally groomed by executives can possibly end with disaster. And one of the hardest of movie making can come from the world of animation. Animation can take a long time to make, from the initial planning to finding a release date. Sometimes their hard work can pay off, and they end up making an all-time classic that everyone will love for generations. Or their hard work will end up being met with a lukewarm response and will fade away, until the few that saw it will spread the word like gospel and becomes a cult hit. Or they just end up by sucking. There were plenty of anime movies stuck in production limbo that could rival those of some of the most notorious production fiascos. Except for Fitzcarraldo. For me, they said they should kill him for you. Und ich sagte, nein, um Gottes Willen, ich brauche ihn hier noch zum Drehen. Dann lasst ihn mir, lasst ihn mir. So today we are taking a look at the top 10 anime movies that took forever to make. Before we begin, a few ground rules for clarification. One, this is not a list about the most notorious production history. That could be a separate video. While there are some crazy behind the scenes stories with these movies, we are only looking at movies that took the longest time to make outside of the usual time it takes to make a movie. For this list, any movie that takes six years or more will be accounted. Two, this is only for a production rather than development, as developing a movie can have challenges all on their own, and oftentimes the initial ideas can change drastically when making the movie begins. So, movies stuck in development hell like Frozen or Treasure Planet will not be counted. Three, this will only include movies that were finished and released to the public. So, movies that were abandoned like the works or ongoing projects like The Overcoat will not be included. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin! Number 10. It's a tie between Delgo and The Simpsons movie. While both movies are often cited as 9 years production, they actually started production much later in the process of around 6-7 to seven years. Yet for the sake of this video, I'm going to include these two here for the sake of commonality. So let's start off with Delgo, the most notorious of the two. Delgo is notorious for being one of the worst performing anime movies ever made. On a budget of over $400 million, it managed to make back just under $1 million. Damn, son! And keep in mind that it went wide. 2,000 theaters this played in only to be pulled immediately after release. So what happened? Well, it's kind of sad, a little funny, uh, but mostly sad. Dogo initially began in development in 1999 with a production starting in 2001. Like many of these movies on this list, instead of being produced by a major studio like Disney or DreamWorks, Dogo was produced on an independent studio. That being the Atlanta-based Fathom Studio. Although that was by design because according to co-director Mark F. Adler, he said that he envisioned the movie as an ambitious animated movie that was going to be darker and mature compared to other movies that were coming out around the time. Along with the hopes of raising the profile of the regional scene, Chief Animator Derek Winslow even said that he sees Delgo outperforming Shrek at the box office. <laughs> oh, you poor soul. Despite initially getting a deal with MGM for distribution that later fell through, much of the production history was basically years of security funding and animating the then new 3D technology of animation, which was proven a challenge for the relatively fresh crew, along with uploading raw footage of scenes to Antes Animation Online, a move that cost the crew a revolving door of animators. This also included getting a celebrity cast, many of whom were either A-listers that later became C-listers like Frey Prince Jr. and Jennifer Love Hewitt, or seasonal vets and character actors like like Eric Idle, Malcolm McDowell, and Anne Bancroft, who died before the movie came out, making this her last credited role. The movie was finished but ran into problems for distribution when MGM backed out due to the restructuring of the company until they struck a deal with distributor for higher freestyle releasing for distribution, being released nationwide in December of 2008, where it crashed and burned. While the animation was impressive at the time of development, the years of work caused this film to look dated by comparison, along with many calling the designs to be ugly and unsettling. The story was also criticized as being derivative of other sci-fi and fantasy works like Star Wars, The Lord of the Rings, and Avatar, which the studio tried to sue James Cameron for plagiarism due to vague parallels between the two movies. Yeah, get in line, buddy. The movie was basically dead on arrival, and to this day, the directors and studio never made another movie again. Delgo still holds the record for being the worst performing computer anime movie going wide, and the second worst opening of all time, right behind the Oogie Loves, which was also released by Freestyle. Hmm. The exact opposite can be said about the Simpsons movie. 
Well, the idea for the movie has been floating around since the beginning of the show, including an early attempt at adapting the season 4 episode Camp Krusty. It wasn't until 1997 that Fox greenlit the movie with production beginning in 2001 once the cast signed on. There were concerns with an attempt at making a movie based on the beloved cartoon, with show creator Matt Groening feeling that the movie had to do something bigger than the TV show, as well as concerns that the staff didn't have a big enough crew to juggle between working on both a show and a feature-length movie that would ruin the show's reputation. A well-founded fear. Still, both Groening and the show's executive producer, James L. Brooks, began developing the screenplay once the cast signed on. They hired veteran Simpsons writers and showrunners Max Scully, Al Jean, Dave Merkin, Mike Rees, George Mayer, John Swordswilder, and John Vitti, as well as former animation director Dave Silverman to direct the film. From there, they developed different ideas that were eventually scrapped, but some did end up becoming a part of Simpsons media one way or the other. Like a story where the family saves manatees that became the season 17 episode, The Bonfires of the Manatees, and another that was a Truman Show-like story where the Simpsons knew they were in a TV show, which sort of appeared in the opening of the movie, as well as being the basis for the Simpsons game. Eventually, Groening read a news story of a town dumping pig feces into the water supply, and from there, the writers springboard off of that idea, and they wrote the script over 100 times. That's right, they rewritten the screenplay so many times, even when animation began. The reason for this was that they wanted the Simpsons movie to be as good as it can be, and was combed thoroughly very closely. This included the movie being tested multiple times and having jokes, characters, and storylines being rewritten, such as Colin and Russ Cargill going through multiple designs and character changes, storylines being altered or edited out, and characters like Kang and Kongos being cut from the final product, while other characters like Sideshow Bob being reduced to a minor status in the movie, even with Kelsey Grammer returning to reprise his role. Speaking of voice work, according to Homer voice actor Dan Castellaneta, the vocal recordings were more intense than recording for the show, with numerous takes and line readings being done over 100 times, such as Marge's video message to Homer. The movie was finally done being mauled over and edited around May of 2007, just two months before the release date, with work saying that various jokes and scenes from the trailers were cut from the final film, and Groening saying that there were two movies worth of material from making this movie. And all their hard work and being connected to popular IP paid off. The movie was an instant success, grossing over $500 million against a $75 million budget, making it not only the most successful movie based on a cartoon, but also the second highest grossing traditionally animated movie ever, right behind The Lion King. The movie also received praise by fans and critics alike. Although nowadays it's debated as to whether or not this was the true downfall of the show. It received a Golden Gold nomination for Best Animated Feature and four Annie Award nominations. All of which lost to Ratatouille, which was directed by veteran Simpsons animator Brad Bird and the reason why he couldn't work on the movie. No! A sequel has been greenlit in 2018 and is currently in development. Whether or not this will take as long as the first movie, there is one thing to be sure. Disney now has a movie where a little boy's peen is shown for a brief second. And that is hilarious. It's bountiful <laughs> penis! Bountiful penis! Number 9. Up next, we travel to the land of the rising sun with Redline, taking a toll of seven years to make. This was the directorial debut of Takashi Kayok. Kiyok. Koyik. Koyak? Yeah, I'm just gonna call him Takashi. I'm a black boy! Previously known for working as a key animator, but has helmed smaller projects like the world record portion of the Animatrix and the OVA Trava Fist Planted, which characters from that anime appeared in Redline. The movie took over seven years to make, as according to Takashi, he wanted absolute controls on the marks he was making, resulting in over 100,000 frames being drawn for the movie. Besides a few VFX works here and there, this was entirely done hand-drawn. Just looking at the animation scenes alone is honestly jaw-dropping that this was done without much help from CGI or Flash. Definitely the animation equivalent to something like Mad Max Fury Road. Unlike other entries on this list, I couldn't find much behind the scenes info on this, so I'm left to speculate that the animation was the sole reason it took so long to make, as Sakashi wanted to have this be a masterpiece of animation, and the studio Madhouse had total faith in him as a director, which given the other properties the studio had under their belt, I doubt they would find it much of a risk. Especially when, sadly, the movie bombed at the Japanese box office. Fortunately, the movie has gotten a following since its initial release, as many consider it to be an underrated classic amongst anime films. Kids, don't do drugs, just watch Redline. It's the only high you need.
number eight. While a movie like Redline doesn't have a lot of notoriety with its lengthy production, the same cannot be said about Lil Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. One of the most notorious examples of development hell, the movie is noted for seven years it took to make, along with the revolving door of creative minds that were attached to this project at one point in time. It all began in 1977 as anime producer Yutaka Fujioka purchased the rights to Renzu McKay's legendary comic strip. For those of you who don't know, Fujioka is the founder of the legendary animation studio TMS, and this was a dream project for Fujioka to produce an adaptation of the series. In doing so, he decided to expand the project to outside Japan by opening up a US subsidiary and hiring or asking various filmmakers and artists to work on the project. This included, but not limited to, George Lucas, Chuck Jones, Brad Bird, Ray Bradbury, Chris Columbus, Mobius, Frank Thomas, Oliver Johnson, the Sherman Brothers, Isao Takahata, and Hayao Miyazaki, the latter of whom infamously called it the worst experience of his professional career. <laughs> Ouch. The reasons for this is because there were difficulties in finding the right story. As Lucas, Takahata, and Miyazaki found it difficult to write a meaningful story with character development when everything took place in a dream. Any progression Nemo had as a character would soon vanish the moment he woke up. While a successful dream story can be possible, just look at The Wizard of Oz. However, for Nemo, that was proven true as the movie was stuck in years of turnaround and little development on an actual story. According to Brad Bird, him and Jerry Reese were asked to work on the project and when they were hired, they would go around asking the animators what they were doing. They responded that they were illustrating what then screenwriter Ray Bradbury was writing. When they asked Bradbury what he was doing, he said he was writing to what the cartoonists were drawing. The duo soon left after that. <laughs> Three pitch pilots were made for the project in hopes that these would lead to the story, but they were all rejected by Fujioka. Eventually, in January of 1988, all the ideas that were pitched and developed in its various stages were then willed down to one story and animation began. Officially finishing around June of that year and hitting theaters a year later on July 15th, 1989, where it bombed. Little Nemo faced competition from the Juggernaut Kiki's Delivery Service, which was directed by Hayao Miyazaki. No! In the States, the film was delayed until a few years later in 1992, where it failed to make an impact. Critical reception was lukewarm as the animation was generally praised, yet the story was criticized for being underwritten and relying more on the visuals to carry the story. However, it did eventually gain a following thanks to strong home video releases, yet because of the failure, Fujioka retired from making animated projects and TMS had to take on animating western shows to recoup the losses from this movie in the 90s. TMS is still around today, yet they haven't made a movie that wasn't based on existing property since. As for the Little Nemo franchise, it will get a new movie adaptation as Netflix announced in January of 2020 that a gendered flipped adaptation would be in the works with Hunger Games director Francis Lawrence will direct and will co-star Jason Momoa. That is either going to be the greatest thing in the world or something truly terrifying. Number 7 While there are plenty of Disney films with long production history, such as The Emperor's New Groove, Tangled, and Dinosaur, only one trumps them all, not counting development. Sleeping Beauty. This movie is noble for its art direction and animation, which happened to be the reason why it took 8 years to make. During the 1940s, Disney was suffering through a financial crisis, largely because World War II tearing the company in half and cutting out international distribution for their feature films, leaving classics like Pinocchio, Bambi, and Fantasia to initially underperform. However, it wasn't until the success of Cinderella that brought the company back on track, and where Sleeping Beauty was born. Greenlit in 1951, the movie went through numerous delays, largely at the behest of Walt Disney. Not just that he was busy making Disneyland at the time, but also that he envisioned the film to be unlike anything Disney has released to that point, saying he wanted the movie to look like moving illustrations. Most notably, this is the first of two animated Disney films to be released in the ride screen format in the 50s, the other being Lady in the Tramp, as well as being presented in the format of a 70mm film reel, although that final product was stretched out to fit the format. 
Another is the art direction. According to production designer Ivan de Earl, the art direction of Sleeping Beauty was a mix between Gothic French, Italian, and pre-Renaissance to give the backgrounds their distinct look. Although he and supervising director Clyde Geronimi clashed over the artistic direction, and when Earl left the project, Geronimi had the backgrounds altered. The stylization of the backgrounds also seeped into the characters too, as characters like Aurora had an angular look to them to match Earl's rigid designs. Completely different from any other Disney character at that point in time. However, this became hard for the animators to draw her. According to a character animator for Aurora, the animation alone took an entire day to make a frame in order to be so careful that the entire second of a footage was made in a month. Speaking of character animation, Walt insisted that the animators paid extra close attention to the human models so that the animation can look like flesh and blood. While using human models were the standard for Disney animation since the beginning of making features, Sleeping Beauty went an actual step further and filmed the models for Aurora and Prince Philip. Although it should be noted that no tracing of the footage was ever used in the final product. The result of the eight years of work, Sleeping Beauty was finally released in 1959 with a budget of around six million dollars. The most expensive Disney film made to that point. It did not end well. <laughs> While the animation was praised, many critics felt that the story wasn't up to snuff with previous Disney films, particularly with how derivative of previous movies like Snow White. The movie was also a box office bomb, making back 5.3 million at the initial box office. The effects of this caused the studio to report its first annual loss in over a decade, and talks within the company that the animation studio would shut down. However, that did not happen, as the studio developed animation techniques to make their movies more cheaper and quicker with the releases like 101 Dalmatian and Sword in the Stone. However, like many other Disney classics, the movie did become successful due to the theatrical re-release and home video sales, and soon became an animated classic and gained critical reappraisal, and was recently selected for preservation by the National Film Registry in 2019. I guess audiences won't be sleeping on this movie anymore. Boo! You stink! Number 6 Secrets Inside Up next is what might be the most hated movie on this list, Food Fight. Legendary for its ugly as sin animation, fever dream story, and a lack of shame when it comes to marketing products to children. Yet, would you know that the actual filmmaking is equally as batshit insane? Because yes, it definitely is. About 12 years of insanity, to be exact. It all started with an underappreciated auteur named Larry Kazanov. Now, Kazanov is no known named Schlub, as he actually had a long time career in the entertainment industry as a producer. First gaining traction as co founder of Lightstorm Entertainment, best known for producing fellow co founder James Cameron's films from Terminator 2 onwards, and later as the producer of all the Mortal Kombat spin off materials in the 90s, like the movies and TV shows and whatever the hell Journey Begins was. However, Kazanov was far more ambitious than a money hungry producer. He was also a money hungry director too. In 1999, he and Joshua Wexler came up with the idea for Food Fight as. Basically, Toy Story, but with mascots. Much like Delgo, which began around the same time, the movie was produced by an independent studio, that being Threshold, which Larry owned, and he would be the main director for the film. Sure, he didn't have any experience as a director, but he did have a writing credit for Mortal Kombat Annihilation. You're alive. Too bad you will die. So we're in good hands. Eventually the movie got both major food brand names to be attached and securing a celebrity voice cast of various high profile actors at the time of around 2002 like Charlie Sheen and Hilary Duff. This went smooth and was about to make it to the estimated 2003 release date, but then the movie was stolen. No, really. According to Kazanov, the hard drives for all the files for the movie were stolen in, in his words, industrial espionage. <coughs> to this day, the original files have yet to be recovered, however, a trailer for the movie does exist. Close to the initial idea of having the animation resemble classic Looney Tunes inspired comedy, and utilizing the squash and stretch technique of animation. And Weird Al doing the theme song? However, all that changed in 2004 when production resumed and Kazanov decided to completely ditch the CGI animation style and instead go for the then novel motion capture technology. That's right, all of this was done in mocap animation, a technique that animators have little knowledge on how to work on, which explains so much as to why the movie looks like that. 
And from then on, the movie became a long and frustrating crawl to the finish line of Larry throwing out vague suggestions on how to improve the material like, make it more awesome! as well as adding in suggestive material that was intended to be goosed by the animators. Like the villainess of the movie, Lady X wearing scantily clad clothing and hitting on the main hero, Rex. Keep in mind, this was meant to be a goof that Larry didn't get. Around this time, Lionsgate decided to throw their hat to the ring as distributors and financing company story arc pitched into the budget in hopes of a 2005 release date. That was missed. In fact, twice! Yes! Both the 2005 and 2007 release date was missed by the production of the film that Lionsgate and other financial backers became furious with Kazanoff for wasting their money. Because of this, in 2011, the movie was auctioned off in a move that I would like to only describe as fucking a stranger in the ass. This is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass, Larry! The movie was sold to Fireman's Fund Insurance Company to finish the film, taking all the animation and other assets so that they can assemble it in the cheapest and quickest way possible, despite the film being nowhere close to being finished or polished and, well, looking like this. But they managed to finish it by 2012 and proceed to do the barest of bare minimum promotion. It received a limited theatrical release in the UK that grossed around the equivalent of $27,000 and dumped on DVD in the US where everyone had convulsions. What Kavanaugh's envisioned as launching his studio to be the next Pixar ended up being a waste of time that ate up around 45 to 65 million dollars. And thus the story of Larry Kazanov, visionary director of our time, came to a sad end. He went back to being a producer and is currently in the works of an untitled Mortal Kombat project in a movie adaptation of... Tetris? Uh, good luck buddy. Number 5 Moving away from the world of terrifying CG animation to the world of stop motion animation, which is also equally terrifying, for our next film, the avant-garde independent film Blood Tea and Red String. Some of you might not have heard of this movie before, so let me introduce you to the head honcho of this entire projection, Christine Sigavsk. Christine is a one-woman show when it came with working on this project and that her film was practically made all by herself. The stop motion puppets were handcrafted by her, the concept and art direction was decided by her, and the animation was done all by herself. Yes, basically every aspect of the movie was done all on her own, with the exception being the sound design which was done during post and she hired somebody else. All the while jumping between various places and studios around the west coast and working on various other projects like illustrations, paintings, and being an animator for other projects as well. The result of all this hard work and dedication was a dialogue free avant-garde masterpiece being released in 2006 to various film festivals around the world and receiving coverage from various outlets like Variety and the New York Times. Not bad for a very small movie. Since then she began busy working on other projects and even teaching as well as filming her next independence project and the sequel to Blood Tea, Seed in the Sand. If you would like to personally support Christine, then please donate to her Patreon page where you can find some cool behind the scenes stuff and help her finance her work. No, this is not a paid promotion, I just found her Patreon page while researching. If I had found anyone else's Patrons, I, too, would promote them. Sorry, Larry. You see what happens when you fuck a stranger there? Number 4 Up next, we're continuing our trip through stop motion. This time, going to our comrades in the north, as well as the newest film on this list, it's the Russian anime film, Hoff Maniata, with a total production history of 17 years. What's interesting about this film is the unique place this has in Russian animation, specifically for the company that made this Soyuz Multifilm. The studio was formed in 1936 by the USSR for production of animated Soviet propaganda. However, the studio eventually moved away from that and began to work on some of the best and most recognizable works in world animation, such as The Hedgehog and the Fog, Tale of Tales, and Chabruska. The studio also became noted for its wide range of animation, often producing animated films and shows that use cell animation, stop motion, and even oil painting. What's interesting is that all of these projects were financed by the Russian government, regardless of the profits it made. But that all changed once when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, meaning that the state couldn't fund the CU's projects like they used to. Funding was slashed and production of projects began to slow down, and they eventually had to get money by signing a deal with Films by Joe for an international distribution that eventually ended in a lawsuit getting the rights back. 
But that didn't deter the studio from producing a big screen animation epic with Hoffmaniata. The film is based on the works of German writer E.T.A. Hoffman, best known for his story The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, aka the basis for the ballet The Nutcracker. Hoffmaniata is about the adventures of Hoffman while he writes his stories and works as a government clerk while also adapting three of his stories. But different from similar sounding projects such as the famous opera The Tale of Hoffman and an unmade script by legendary Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Production began in 2001 with famed Russian artist Mikhail Kamiakin working on the art direction and directed by Stanislav Sokolov, best known for his Emmy winning adaptation of Shakespeare's Winner's Tale. The film was going to be the Sioux's biggest and most ambitious film since the fall of the Soviet Union, with over 150 stop motion puppets being made for the feature, all of those puppets taking over a month to make. The first story was finished filming by 2006 and premiered to praise in Russia, and hopes of getting finances. However, production soon halted as the Sioux ran out of money to finance the film. For the next few years, the production began in a long going on again off again process as funding was being secured, with animators often working on the project being underpaid or not being paid at all, and the studio was getting close to bankruptcy. That wasn't until 2011 when the Russian government decided to finance the studio again. This eventually got the company back on track, and Hoffmaniata continues its production until the finish line in 2018, when it premiered at the Annecy International Animation Film Festival to much praise, winning the Golden Eagle eagle for best anime feature, which is the equivalent of a golden globe. So good on ya comrades! Number 3 Taking Bronze is the Tragedy of Man This shares a few things in common with Hoffmaniata. Both were produced in former communist countries, in this case Hungary. Both took ages to make due to financing, and both ambitious adaptations of fame literature. The movie was directed by Marcel Jankovic, a Hungarian animator best known for his Oscar-nominated short film Sisyphus, which was later used for a GMC Yukon hybrid ad for the 2008 Super Bowl, and The Struggle, which won the short film Palm Dior in 1977. The Tragedy of Man originally began production in 1983 as an animation adaptation of the play of the same name, with production beginning around 1988. While Jankovic's other films were made around the time span of three years, the production for The Tragedy of Man would be a lot longer because of the film adapting all 15 acts of the original play, meaning that the production time would double to six years and a runtime of around 160 minutes well over the average anime movie length of around 70 to 90 minutes. However, things took a turn in 1989. That was when numerous Eastern European countries that were ruled by communist governments had revolutions by the people to overthrow the government, which included Hungary, an event that signaled the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Because of this, Jankovic couldn't get funding from the Hungarian government, and production was forced to slow down to a crawl in order to seek financing. However, instead of stopping, and because of the different acts of the play, Jankovic animated each act one at a time over the 23 years of production, finishing one segment, then securing funding by continuing with the next segment, including an attempt at asking the BBC for help, which they declined due to the project being quote-unquote too Hungarian. The results are that each act of the movie was animated in a completely different style of animation, making it more of a unique animated anthology, or the equivalent of the Shrek reanimated project. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> a few of the segments were even shown at festivals and TV over the years in order to raise funds, although majority of the film was kept away from the public until its completion. The movie was finally finished in 2011, with the budget ballooning of around the equivalent of $2.3 million. Despite the length of time it took to make, the movie was a success in Hungary, where it had 2,000 admissions, making it one of the most successful Hungarian movies of that year, and despite not receiving a coveted Rotten Tomatoes score, the three professional critics who have seen it gave it positive reviews. It goes to show the dedication One Vision has, and the flexibility it took to finish it under strange circumstances. Number 2 Second to last is the legendary French anime masterpiece, The King and the Mockingbird. This is one of the more interesting cases of production history because while it took over four years to make initially, beginning the project in 1948, before being forced to completion in 1952, the director of the film later continued work on this feature up until 1980 after production initially commenced, making it well over 30 years for essentially a patch of the film. 
The animator in question being Paul Grimault, a legendary French animator that practically planted the seeds of animation there with his studio, Lex Grimault. Grimault produced numerous short films during Nazi-occupied France in the early 30s, before production of the first animated French feature film, an adaptation of The Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep. The movie was a collaboration between Grimault and legendary French writer Jacques Prevert, best known for his poetry but also contributing to writing screenplays, such as Children of Paradise, for which he was nominated for an Oscar. Production continued up until 1950 when the production was forced to a halt. While well, the film was close to completion with only a fifth of the film left unfinished, the expenses of the film was too much to handle and so the movie was shelved and the studio was forced to close. Against the wishes of Grimault and Pervert, the film's producer released the unfinished film at the Venice Film Festival in 1952. From there, the movie was left as it was for a number of years up until 1967 when Grimault regained the rights to his film. From there, he began to develop a new version of the film and finish it in the vision he intended throughout the 70s. This new version cut out 20 minutes of the original film's 62 minute runtime, adding in new animated scenes, a new soundtrack, and a new ending for the film. By 1980, the film was finally finished and given its current title to differentiate itself with the original release, with a total of around 30 years to make the film. Although, if you can take out the gaps in between the initial release and securing the rights, it's roughly around 14 to 15 years of production, give or take. Since then, it's been considered one of French's most influential animated films, with Studio Ghibli directors Hayao Miyazaki and Zayo Takahata citing it as influences on their work. While the initial vision was compromised, it was at least more successful in getting across its initial vision as production halted. The same could not be said for our number one entry. Number one. I mean, what else could it be? Yes, even after all these years, no other movie has topped The Thief and the Cobbler's notorious production history of nearly 30 years of production time, making it not just the longest anime movie to produce, but the movie with the longest production time total. Unless you count Orson Welles' The Other Side of the Wind, and whatever these other two movies are. But they aren't in the Guinness Books of World Records, now- <clears throat> Yes, the story is that of crazy determination and eventual heartbreak of years and years of hard work only to be sabotaged by Hollywood. It all began with the director and main visionary behind the project, the legendary Richard Williams. Originally birthed after the abandoned The Amazing Nasrum, which was an animated adaptation of the Mula Nasrindin folklore based on the book series of him by Idris Shah. After a falling out between the two over supposed embezzlement, Williams, who retained the rights to certain characters he specifically created, and later made into the beast of a movie we now know. Now, Williams was working in an independent animation studio in the UK, and while the film did have interest in potential distributors like Paramount, the budget for the movie had to be secured by working on other projects while The Thief and the Cobbler was still in production, such as animating commercials, intros for movies, and even animating specials such as the oscar winning adaptation of A Christmas Carol. And while those did catch the eyes of many, including animators who flocked to work with Williams' on this movie, there were a lot of setbacks and red flags. One of the big ones being that the movie was often in the back burner as the studio focused on other projects to keep the lights on. Another was Williams himself creating a very perfectionist attitude towards the movie, wanting to truly push the boundaries and have it be like no other anime movie that has ever been done before. Some of these ambitious ideas included having the digital leads not speaking throughout the movie, having every scene be filled with complex and detailed designs and animation, and also animating in ones. Which for you non-animation people, that means that instead of drawing twos, which would be 12 frames per second, ones would mean that each scene would be drawn at 24 frames per second. Keep in mind that the movie had scenes like this. The result of this ambition is that the animated scenes and characters would have to be redone, the budget to go over, and consistent missing deadlines to backers, along with before mentioned works on different projects to keep the studio afloat, causing its notorious production history. While many potential backers love the animation Williams and his team made, they were often scared off by the missing deadlines and the hefty price tag. However, all of that changed when the demo reel of the film caught the eyes of filmmaking titan Steven Spielberg, who hired Williams and his team to work on a Robert Zemeckis movie he was producing called Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Eddie Valiant, you're under arrest! 
Well, that movie also went over budget. With the blockbuster success and claim, Lud Williams to win two Oscars for his work on the film, and interest in Warner Brothers to help produce and distribute the film. Williams, feeling confident that he can work in a professional major studio environment, agreed to the deal, and thus the money came to fully produce The Thief and the Cobbler. Hypothetically, you would imagine Williams shaking the hand of Warner Brothers, saying to himself, There's no way this could fail. Well, guess what, Dick? It failed. Oh! Even with the backing of a major studio, Williams' perfectionism clashed with the looming deadline of 1991. This led to a revolving door of animation staff who were fired and worked overtime to complete the damn movie, which sadly never happened. Although the closest was a work print that Williams made with the finished animation he had as well as storyboards and other test animation. Warner Brothers backed out due to dissatisfaction with the test footage, with interest waning towards television animation, and also fearing competition from a certain Disney movie that might have some similarities to this movie. The movie was then taken from Williams by the Completion Bond Company, who signed a deal with Warners that the film would be finished no matter what, and ousted William and the crew out of the production. Wanting to finish the film as cheaply as possible, producer Fred Calvert took the reins to finish the film with the intentions of having it be as close to the work print and Williams' vision as possible while also throwing in tact and Disney-like musical numbers. After years of making, the 30-year-old development finally came to rest in 1993 under the name The Princess and the Cobbler, only to have it be cut again and added a slapdash celebrity voice cast by Miramax in 1994 at the behest of Harvey Weinstein. It just keeps on getting worse! The response was... Honestly, kind of heartbreaking. While many did love the animation done by Williams, the compromised cuts by the Bond company Miramax did ruin the final product, and with no luck in major distribution, it only received a limited theatrical screenings, causing the film to gross less than $500,000 on a budget of an estimated $24 million. Well, there was one last attempt to salvage the intended vision by Disney, that never happened as the animation division was seeing a sea change at the time. For years, Williams was left heartbroken by the experience and never spoke about the film, and never seen the versions by the Bond Company and Miramax. Although, Williams' son Alex did see it and told his dad that he should watch it if he felt like jumping off a bridge. However, that isn't the end of the story. While it's true that the experience resulted in Williams getting fucked in the ass, the Legend of the Thief and the Cobbler grew amongst animation fans and animators alike, and due to Williams' other work on some of the most widely acclaimed pieces of animation ever, as well as publishing what many consider the holy bible of animation know-how titled The Animator's Survival Kit, the movie has since been seen as the triumph it was initially hailed to be. This has included a fan-made restoration project titled The Recobbled Cut that got the film as close to the work print as it possibly could, getting archived at the Academy of Motion Pictures Art and sciences, influencing numerous animation projects like the acclaimed Irish films The Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea, and getting a documentary based on the film's history titled Persistence of Vision. While Williams later became contempt with his legacy of his masterpiece, he never finished the project like he intended, but still continued the rest of his life working on another animated project, which produced the Oscar-nominated short Prologue before passing away last year. That wraps up this list. I think we can safely say that the lesson that should be learned here after hearing countless stories of long, uncompromised work is that never try anything and just live your life as a passionless bum working in accounting. <laughs> Hey, this life, no. this life, no.